Welcome to Scripture Insights. Normally Taylor welcomes you all, but I decided to go rogue today and I'm going to welcome everybody. I'm Mike Harris. I'm Taylor Halverson. And today we're going to dive into Moroni chapter 1 through 6. They're really short chapters, but they're jam-packed with precious gems. I love the fact that Moroni didn't know that he was going to still be alive. And he wasn't planning on writing more. In fact, Mormon chapter 8 and Mormon chapter 9 before the book of Ether are almost each like their own final words that Mormon thinks, I'm gone. And yet he's still alive and he preserves some of the most precious truths we find anywhere in scripture. But he has this intro chapter explaining his circumstances and why he now has the time and opportunity to, to share these additional teachings. Notice here, Taylor, how Moroni, who didn't expect to still be alive, he thought he'd be dead, he thought he'd be killed by these Lamanites. Notice how he describes these terrorists, these bloodthirsty uh, Lamanites. Verse two, they're exceedingly fierce, they put to death every Nephite that will, not, that will not deny the Christ. And then shockingly, he says, you know, I'm so glad I can stay alive so I can write this record that it could benefit these people and their future posterity. That's just astounding. <laughs> Instead of feeling like I want to get even with these people because they killed my dad and women and children and they've tortured them. No, I'm glad I'm still alive so I can bless them in their future generations. What an example of being a true witness, a special witness of Jesus Christ. And it's one thing to say that you should love your enemies. It's another to live it. But wow, Moroni certainly does that. In fact, his, in verse 3, he says, I, Moroni, will not deny the Christ. And what you're pointing out is he is exuding that, living what it means to be Christ-oriented, which includes forgiving your enemies and seeking to bless them. I always thought of that. I won't deny the Christ as just a verbal thing, mm -hmm. but it's also in the way you live. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, he lives it. Verse four, you might also write a little note, the title page of the Book of Mormon. Moroni wrote the title page of the Book of Mormon and the theme of the Book of Mormon going out to the Lamanites to teach them of the covenants of the fathers and also to teach us is represented here also in verse four. So let's, look at these precious words that Moroni now is able to preserve for us. He records, for example, the words that Christ had spoken to the disciples uh, when he had laid hands on them. Back, back in 3 Nephi chapter 11. Yeah. He called them by name, saying, ye shall call on the Father in my name in mighty prayer, and after you've done this, ye shall have power that to him, upon whom ye shall lay your hands, ye shall give the Holy Ghost, and in my name shall ye give it, for thus do, do my apostles. And notice that three times you see here the phrase laid his hands. Verse one, verse two, and then if you go to chapter three, verse two, you see it again. Anciently, the laying on of hands described what the priest would do when you brought a sacrificial animal to the mm -hmm. temple. And that would symbolize that the animal was being set apart for temple, to, to be slaughtered, to be sacrificed there at the temple. And this could suggest that when somebody gets set apart by the laying out of hands today in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that we are manifesting that we are willing to sacrifice our time, our talents, to serve God. Not that God's expecting us to be slaughtered, mm -hmm. but we are wholly giving ourselves to building up his kingdom. And building on that is hands are a symbol of power. Hey, look, could God give people power without touching them? He could choose, choose to do it. But there's something about the tangible nature of the head is seen as the crown, the key aspect of the body, and the hands are the most powerful part of the body. And when you connect them, where one person's hands, their power is now being transferred to the being of the next person, symbolically. That's kind of the symbol that, that we see here. Well, then he describes in chapter three, the manner of ordaining priests and teachers in the church. And notice how he talks about prayer always preceded the ordinance. 
Verse 2, after they had prayed unto the Father in the name of Christ, they laid their hands upon them and said, and notice how often all these things are done in the name of Jesus Christ because he ultimately is the power. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you to be a priest, or if it be a teacher, I ordain you to be a teacher to preach repentance and remission of sins through Jesus Christ by the endurance of faith on his name to the end. Does he ordain them to preach how do the pearly gates swing? Uh, when will the second coming be? Will it be next week? Is it going to be in the year 2033? Because Right. There's a lot of things we talk about in church, and there's a lot of meaningful things, but notice we should always be emphasizing Jesus Christ and alignment to him through faith and repentance and doing that continuously that we are on the covenant path. They're not ordained to teach a whole bunch of a lot of other things. Now, again, there's lots of great things to talk about in the gospel, but let's not forget the basics. In chapter 4, it keeps us riveted on those basics, where we get the wording for the sacrament prayer. There's so many words that we could point out. I, I like the idea of remembrance of the body of thy son. The body doesn't just exclusively refer to Jesus Christ's flesh and bones, his resurrected body, but Paul taught us that the body of Christ mm. is the church. And to remember not only Jesus Christ, but we need to remember each other. Mm. And again, remember, as used in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, can either mean to remember like a mental exercise, but also can mean, in fact, it's the primary meaning is to make mention. Mm -hmm. We need to make mention of Jesus Christ's resurrection. We need to make mention of our good brothers and sisters. And, and, uh, and how God has delivered them yeah. and, and nourishing them. When I reread this uh, recently, I circled at the beginning of verse 3 the word ask. And actually, before we even read this verse, let's just reinforce that what if Moroni had passed away? Now, God revealed the same passages in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's not like God couldn't give this, but just how precious these words are that Moroni uh, gives them to us. But It shows, though, the consistency of the covenants and ordinances. The procedures of the endowment and how things are run sometimes change and mm -hmm. are, are refined, but the covenants, ordinances have always been the same. Yeah. Let's read this passage, and I circled the word ask, because this is a pleading prayer. The sacrament prayer, both of them, we are requesting something. So let's read it, and let's listen to what we're requesting, and what the outcomes of those requests should be, and what we're committing to in order to receive the outcome of the request. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they are, are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. So we are asking for blessing and sanctification to our souls. That's, part, that's the early part of the verse. Why? So that we will eat in remembrance and witness so that we show we're willing to take upon us the name of the Son and always remember him and keep his commandments so that we may always have his spirit to be with us. Uh, I wonder, we, we hear this prayer so often and sometimes it's kind of rushed through by the, uh, by the priests that sometimes we miss the opportunity just to slow down and dwell a bit more on the meaning of these words. The most important ordinance that we engage in on a regular basis in the church is sacrament. And we 
sometimes kind of rush it. No. Elder Quentin L. Cook said, quote, I believe that weekly participation in sacred sacrament meetings has spiritual implications we do not fully understand, close quote. And that was in April of 2017. There's, there's something sacred here. And I think you and I, Taylor, and our listeners, I don't think we undervalue the, I, I, I think we all realize it's sacred, but I think there's something more there that we still all have, that the Heavenly Father wants us to understand about the, uh, the sacrament that we don't fully realize yet. And one of those things might be just feeling God's mercy, His love, His deliverance. That is the purpose of this ritual, of this ordinance, is to remind us of God's enduring love. When we go to the sacrament table, we should feel the Spirit of God reminding us His arms of mercy are forever extended towards us. President Dallin H. Oaks underscores a, a word here. He thinks it's very significant that it says that they are willing to take upon them the name. It doesn't say that they will take upon the name or that they have taken, but they're, they're manifesting willingness. Or and, desire. Or desire. In his April 1985 talk, he says, it is significant that when we partake of the sacrament, we do not witness that we take upon us the name of Jesus Christ. We witness that we are willing to do so. The fact that we only witness our willingness suggests that something else must happen before we actually take the sacred name upon us in the most important sense. He asked then, what future event or events could this covenant contemplate? And I recommend looking at the whole talk, but he gives some possibilities, but the one that I'd like to emphasize, he says, by partaking of the sacrament, we witness our willingness to participate in the sacred ordinances of the temple. So maybe it's kind of, maybe this is how I would explain it. When we partake of the sacrament, Let's use the marriage metaphor. All throughout the Bible, Jesus considers himself the bridegroom, the husband, and he gets married to his bride, the church. And when we partake of the ordinance of the sacrament, it's almost as if we're manifesting that we're willing to be eventually married, but right now we're just dating or engaged. Mm. And then once you actually partake of the, or you participate in the endowment, in the then you fully take upon you the name of Jesus Christ. It's as if you've entered into a marriage covenant hmm. and the covenant and the relationship is now heightened. That's, that's really beautiful. We should compare and contrast the sacrament prayer for the bread to the sacrament prayer for the wine, or we now use water. And there's a few just very brief differences but overall, the message is the same. It begins with, we ask thee. But let's actually read this whole prayer. O God, the eternal Father, we ask thee, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they do always remember him, so that, or that, they may have his spirit to be with them. One of the differences we have here is we don't have the phrase in the wine or the water prayer that we have in the bread prayer. They are willing to take upon them the name of thy son. Now, it doesn't mean we're not willing to do that. It's just one little uh, difference that the prayer on the water is just a bit shorter, but the essence of this is the same. It's about remembering what Jesus has done for us, his great deeds, so that we can have deliverance. And that deliverance is mediated through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and that deliverance is mediated, that atonement is mediated through the Holy Ghost. And when we always have the Spirit to be with us, we always have a member of the Godhead accompanying us, and we are cleansed so that we can be in the presence of God. In chapter 6, 
it talks about how we should treat those that are baptized into his church. And I'm, I'm seeing some fascinating, powerful parallels between chapter four and five with the sacrament prayers and how we should remember Jesus and, and how we are willing to take upon his name. And we're supposed to then in turn do that same, we should show that same devotion to these newly baptized members of the church. In fact, look at verse four. Uh, they were numbered among the people of the church of Christ and their mm -hmm. names were taken. That same language is used in the sacrament prayer, chapter four, verse three, that they take upon them the name of thy son. And why? Go back to chapter six, that they might be remembered. And why do we take the sacrament? That we might remember him. The, the seriousness, the sacredness in taking Christ's sacred name upon us, we should feel something similar in our relationships with church members. Yeah, you made this point really well. I'd never thought about it before, that when we remember the body of Jesus Christ, it is his sacrifice we remember, but by extension, remembering the body of the church. And as the church grows and expands, as the body grows, we need to continue to remember those who are coming into the church so that they might be nourished. And actually, sacrament is a form of nourishment. I mean, we're, we are eating. Without eating, you die. And God tries to signal to us that if we don't continuously eat of him or of his word, we also die. And it is our job as members of the body to remember the body that all parts of the body should be nourished. This is really, really helpful because it helps us to realize that the summary of the gospel is love God, love your neighbor. And most of us, I think, understand the love God part. Um, I think probably my greatest struggle in life is how do I really love everybody on, uh, on earth that I've been asked to love? And this is one way of doing it. Am I remembering people and helping to nourish them by the good word of God. Isn't that maybe one of the best indicators of how much we truly love God? How do we measure how sincere my love is for God? Probably shown by how I love others. You would think that they would be separate, right? Because you'd think it'd be easy to love God because he's so nice and generous, but it's really reflected on how I treat other people. And, the other people might be prickly and they might be hard to love. Right. God said the first great commandment, love God, and the second is like unto it, right? Mm -hmm. there, we, there's a lot of, what's the word, uh, overlap between the first and the second commandment. Moroni continues on this uh, chapter, which is not very long, explaining the simple nature of how the church was organized and managed on a regular basis that how did they remember and nourish the body of Christ, these members who joined? Verse five, they did meet together often and fast and pray. They speak with one another concerning the welfare of their souls. That's like they make mention of Jesus Christ they remembered. They did meet together off to partake of the bread and wine in remembrance of the Lord. And down in verse eight and nine, as often as they repented, they sought forgiveness with real intent, they were forgiven. And then Moroni concludes this chapter with, they conducted the church and church meetings after the manner of the workings of the Spirit. And we get in Moroni chapter 10, a number of the gifts of the Spirit that he describes to help us understand when we have received Jesus Christ in our lives, that should be exemplified by our gifts being magnified. And each of us have one, if not more, of the gifts of the Spirit or gifts from God. And all of those are meant to build, nourish, and sustain the body of Jesus Christ. As we listen to some of these final words from Moroni, we hope that we all can feel more desirous to be in God's presence by regularly partaking of the sacrament meaningfully and with feeling, recognizing the great things he's done for us as he nourishes us in the faith. May we do the same for others in our communities. And we leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.